Welcome to Das Boat, season two, Dose Boat. Now, in season one, we bought a boat on the internet, sight unseen. This is what we got. This is my boat. I'm selling from neutral. I think we just broke the ship here. That boat traveled to five different fisheries in three different states across more than 1,400 miles and somehow, what was that? Survived the journey. For season two, we've got a new old boat. We like to call it Dose Boat, one well stocked with fishing memories. It was owned by my childhood fishing mentor, a feller by the name of John Gary. We're gonna drag this classic craft across the upper Midwest, hand her off to some of our favorite anglers, give her a few upgrades, and take her to places she has and has not been before, and maybe oh, yeah. catch a few Ooh, fish. Got a muskie. And like last season, there will probably be some bad ideas along the way. Oh shit, the trader's rolled. Wow. This is Das Boat. In this episode, Das Boat crosses the Straits of Mackinac that divide Lake Michigan from Lake Huron, and then heads west across the Upper Peninsula to the border where Wisconsin meets the UP. There, you'll find one of the finest smallmouth rivers that you've probably never heard of. The Menominee River has been a relatively well-kept secret in these parts, even in an age where fishing secrets seem like quaint relics of the past. It's as close to wilderness as you're going to find in the modern Midwest. In the previous episode, Giannis and guide Brian Kosminski did their damnedest to track down some trout in the lower peninsula, but ran into buckets of rain, cool temperatures, and finicky fish. They saved the trip on the last day by digging into a few local lakes, smallmouth, finally putting some bends in their rods and some meat on the grill. In this episode, we're starting out targeting smallmouth, a native bass up here known locally as bronze backs, smallies or small jaws, to name a few. The bass on this river are completely different animals from their counterparts further south. They act different, think different, they even look different. These are wild, slow-growing fish known for their habit of attacking prey on the surface and fighting harder than just about anything else that swims in fresh water. They're survivors in a climate that does not favor weakness. Meat Eater's own Joe Cermelli. It is a lot of fun, and that fish was hot. Teams up with Tim Landweir, <laughs> who's been guiding this area for 25 years and successfully built a business and a client base from nothing. Tim and his crew turned an unknown river full of unknown fish into a destination fishery. Tim, along with his cousin Bart and their ironclad crew, spend their early summers sleeping in a decrepit trailer, swapping a few months of comfort for the satisfaction of living on a remote river full of fish. These guys introduce strategies and equipment they learned while guiding for trout out west, bringing western-style drift boats and fly fishing techniques to Wisconsin, showing these big river smallmouths something they'd never seen before. A Canadian mining company is eager to dig a large open pit sulfide mine on the edge of the Menominee. And for the first time in 25 years, Tim is willing to risk exposing the name of the river in hopes that he might enlist more advocates to help protect it. You gotta admire a guy who's willing to risk his favorite fishery and possibly his livelihood to save the place he loves. I'll let Tim cover that later. First, there's some work to do. Tim, I Joe, I'm good, man. How are you? Good. Good to see you, brother. What's going on, dude? This this is it, huh? We're meeting this together. All I've, right. I fished out of worse. <laughs> I fished out of better. I'm not gonna lie to you. I, I have not. 
Oh, okay. Okay, it's spectacular. Dude, I kind of have a general idea of what your rivers are like up here, but okay. I have not fished this far up in yeah. uh, Wisconsin. Can we fish these rivers in this boat? We, we can fish these <laughs> rivers in this boat. Uh, you know, it's typically a considerably skinnier water right now. Right. But we've had lots of lots and lots of rain. Um, so so things have changed maybe a little bit on maybe our, our plan. You got enough weight in it with me in it. So we gotta lose this engine. Joe Cermelli is Meat Eater's senior fishing editor and a self-proclaimed smallmouth junkie. Joe's traveled all over the place catching just about every popular sport fish you can imagine from striper to tuna. He's caught them all. But one of his favorite fish are scrappy, aggressive smallmouth that are willing to eat on the surface. Step one, motor off. Agreed. That's the, that's the easy, hard one. Right, right. <laughs> it's gonna make my life way better in the next couple of days. Um, step two, let's uh, replace. I think, the, I think the bolts are okay, but I'm good. we're gonna need new washers, lock washers underneath there, et cetera. So let's, let's get these yeah, completely that's not... dialed in. Now I need those yeah, really well done. <laughs> Even though Kaz and Yanni claim to have set this boat up for river running, Tim is deeply unimpressed with their handiwork. Sometimes, when you inherit a boat, you have to fix the work that the last guys messed up. Uh, fix or locks. You want to rework the anchor system a I little do. bit. It's yeah. a good start, but what do you want to do to it? The anchor rope is too fine, the diameter is too fine. I'd like to get like a 5 8 like a oh, derby 5 yeah, 8 yeah. rope on that. And then like a quick link C-clip. Uh, for the anchor itself, uh, that little beaner is not going to hold it in that anchor. We're going to need a little bigger rock for that. So, with the flows up, are you worried about us holding period regardless of the anchor system? Yeah. 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 Okay. I, I am. And uh, we'll take a look, and we can we can play with some of that anchor fix. Anything else that we need? I don't think so. Once again, the motor needs to come off in order to maneuver this rig down the river. They also need to pull off the transducer and reconfigure the oar locks. Basically, they need to redo all the busted ass janky modifications made by the jokers before them, which is pretty typical in boat world. Go ahead, keep going. Couple more feet. Woo! Yeah. I think this is great. These are in perfect shape, so we're gonna keep these, these locked. But like, this is a disaster. I mean, <laughs> Look at that. That's, yeah. a, that's, that's nice handiwork right there. I need to definitely put some backing plates or some wash. Yeah, we need not drywall screws. <laughs> so how many years do you actually have in on these rivers? This is year number 20. So some of the guys that you'll meet, like some of our guides and stuff, it's, we, we started this out and we were some of the first guys ever to bring drift boats over to the Midwest here. and had to convert all of our trout people into like, you should try smallmouth bass. And now it's the biggest part of our business. I was gonna say, I mean, in, from my perception, traveling anglers, like guys who travel to destinations for smallmouth has really upticked in like the last 10 years. It's real. 20 years ago, it was sort of like a niche thing and now it's become a very in thing to do. We we're the first guys to buy a drift boat right. in Wisconsin. And they're like, well, if it doesn't work out, you can sell it in Michigan. I mean, like, it was, it was real. And, and when we started to talk to customers about it, they would be, uh, yeah, I mean, it was almost like a drug deal. You'd be like, hey, you want to go try something different? There's some smallmouth bass. But the lake culture for smallmouth has always been Huge, there. huge, huge. Yeah, but it's just, it's just changed. And uh, the rivers made it cool. You know what I mean? Like, in the fly fishing realm, the rivers made it cool. Where before, you know, bass boats and everything right. else, it wasn't, really didn't fit the fly culture. I mean, they weren't ready for it at that time. But you bring drift boats to it in wild rivers and then a fish that fights 10 times harder than a trout, and like immediately you got them. Das Boat's rowing setup is now held together with actual bolts instead of cute little drywall screws. Hopefully that'll make it a sturdy river running vessel. Whoever did the work on this prior to it knew they that, just knew that's better, though. that a Yeti 65 was going to fit in there perfectly. Yep. Tim even manages to find something positive to say about the previous crew's handiwork. How about that for Midwest Nice? This is going to be fine. It puts enough weight to the front. The way that we move the seat back changes the distribution in the boat, which is key. I just don't want to have all, you know, right. all the push. The so-called anchor system also needs a bit of work. Uh, one thing we just have to be careful of is anchor, rope. anchor yeah. system. 
because the anchor system is is a mod that's like super important. We plan to be dropping the anchor a lot. This rope in here is like way too thin. Yep. Like way too thin. That is a hand grabber. Lastly, Dose Boat finally gets a cup holder. So you would have thought this modification would have come much earlier in, in the series here. Look at that. Now that they've redone all the work that was supposed to get finished in the previous episode, hopefully their handiwork will get them into some of those warm water hogs whose rod bending abilities would make those effete little trout blush. Rolling down early morning roads with a boat bumping down the trailer behind you, notice I said on the trailer, not dragging along next to the trailer, creates a special kind of anticipation. Doesn't much matter how big or nice the boat is, the extra draft behind the truck represents freedom and possibility. That feeling is palpable as the guys launch the boat under a quote unquote secret dam. And its secrecy will hold, at least to everyone who has yet to find out that there's such a thing called Google. Anyway, Tim is willing to talk about the Menominee River and bring Joe here because he wants to save his watershed. But that doesn't mean he's willing to give away every little single detail. So, I mean, nowadays there are a lot of waters that have issues and there's sort of a collective idea that it's a secret, but if maybe more people know about it, more people care. Right. But there are also people who, who sort of don't buy into that. But I mean, that's, that's clearly your camp here. It, 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 it is the camp and, and we've, we've kept this under wraps. We've stayed busy with 10 guides seven days a week for right. almost 20 years. Right. And we've screamed very quietly about how epic and awesome the river is. Sure. But like now is the time, like we have to say something. So. Well, I'm, I'm honored to, to be on the secret stretch while it's still secret. <laughs> I hope we're, uh, I wanna say, I hope we're not screwing that up, but like, I guess we, like, we sort of need to a little bit. So we have that, to bring uh, some awareness this fishery to this. Yeah. stays as strong as it is. Absolutely. But what are you, what are we starting with, man? What are you tying on? I'm, I'm gonna start with some top water. I think like a, like a popping bug, maybe like a size four olive, uh, popping bug, some dragonflies and stuff around. Okay. And you look at the water right now, like it's greasy, perfect. Beautiful. Like this is top water. But, okay. So we also, we want to try and get some pike yeah. to cook up later. Absolutely. So I'll be the barbarian. Do it. Tying on 20 pounds That's of stick fantastic. bait. fantastic. So we're going to hit some frog water along this, yeah. some pikey we'll, stuff we'll, too. We'll get to a couple pike pike spots. We'll try to put a couple uh, I hope it's not that fire. good because I love pike and could easily be <laughs> talked into just doing that. You understand. We want to catch pike, so we won't. Right. <laughs> The primary targets on this mission are smallmouth bass, but because they are slow to grow and reproduce up here, they're gonna release the smallmouth and look for a few pike to bring home for dinner. Got him. Nice, there you go. Got him. Oh, that's a small jaw, dude. That's a smallie. Oh! oh! That's a big bass. He took under the chin, it didn't Was really it? count. Oh, he's uh, back. He's back. <laughs> <Made it again. laughs> Our bass are so cool. What the hell just happened, dude? Did, did, that, did he have did, another did, one with him? If that had to be a follower, dude. There's just no way. I've never seen anything like that before, dude. Sometimes when a fish gets hooked, before. some of his buddies will follow along, curious as to what the heck is going on. In this case, the fish Joe initially hooks spits the bait, but then the follower took advantage of what she thought was an abandoned meal. This does occasionally happen, but it's unique for the fish to both be this big. Survey says, oh, that's almost oh, Steve McQueen. Uh, dude, she's a, she's a 20 on the nuts. Damn right she is. Doesn't that mean I get a hat or something? You do. We'll talk right. about that. Now, wait a second and hold up. 20 inches is a big ass deal. No matter where you go in this country, 20 inches is the threshold of true trophy status for river smallmouth. And fish like this make the Menominee a special public fishery. First fish, 20 inches. That's a pretty good start. I mean, if that's your thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna, it's gonna, know? it's gonna be harder to beat that. <laughs> they eat that bait. Do you think it's fair to say that the reason there's such low traffic here is because Wisconsin and the Midwest in general has like a much more lake fishing culture in terms of, especially like with catching fish to eat, walleye and things like that? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, that's why here we are on a Sunday afternoon and we've seen no other fishermen. Well, I mean, yeah. a group of fishermen, but hundred percent, the entire Midwest is all lake culture. 
and uh, that's what they do. They don't river fish. Right, right. But do you see sort of the same fish for food mentality of the guys that fish here as, as you see in the still waters around no, here? No, no, I would say in, in the river environment with, when it comes to smallmouth bass, I would say the majority of anglers are catch and release on, on smallmouth sure. rivers. Yeah. In lakes and things, I know Washington Island, the Bay of Green Bay Lake, Michigan, there's a little bit more so, harvest in some of those right. areas. Those are also supplemented stocked fish in a lot of cases. In in, in most cases, yeah. In, in a lot of cases, they are. The cool part about like this river, which is really unique, is like these are our native fish. Right. These have never been planted. Pure wild. It's a yeah. very cool fish, and I, I believe that the Algonquin word for smallmouth is Ashigan, or the one who struggles. So through deforestation, through all of this other stuff, like. The smallmouth have survived without supplement. One of the advantages of fishing light presentation is getting in front of fish in skinny water, which can be harder to cover with heavy and more traditional smallmouth baits and lures. Tim urges Joe to fish shallower water than normal in search of unpressured fish. I'll stop us. Good, tight. Yeah. Yep. It's cool having a dude like you that's super fishy. Like, you trust me, though, on those flats, because there's a lot of guys like, no, it's dude, I get it. It's too small. I, you I've, know. I've seen that in other places. Right. Yep. And the average person would never think that there'd be fish like that in there. Right. And it's like, we get big ones there. Yeah. <laughs> they just don't want to come to this boat, man. No. Oh, popped Ooh. it. That's a perfect right. release. That's a perfect right. release. So as we're floating, I'm starting to see more and more posted signs, no trespassing mm -hmm. signs. And I know there's a big proposal for an open pit mine yeah. right in this area that, that you and your crew really think could be concerning and, and have some sort of backlash to the river here. Oh, 100%. As we've been just going down the river, Joe, you, saw, you see those posted signs. And those posted line, signs are all um, land parcels that Aquila, which is a Canadian mining company, right. they have the, the, the uh, mineral rights all the way down the river, and I'll show you all of this. Some had some houses behind them. I mean, are they coming in and just they're buying, buying, they're buying the buying houses the property? Yeah. Or, or the houses that are existing there? And who's going to want to live next to this open sure, mine? Sure. But the real concern behind this is this is a full sulfide mine, and um, they're moving moving quickly forward right, on this thing. Right. But it's a hundred. It's less than 150 feet from the banks of the river. It's massive. Yeah. It's absolutely massive. It's in Michigan, and you know we can do nothing as Wisconsinites, but it dumps directly into Lake Michigan. Historically, open pit mines don't have a, a, a great track record of success in terms of environmental issues. The community, certain portions of it, they said seven to 12 years of extraction, and then it's done. Right. So what right. happens then is after seven to 12 years, the mine shuts down, we're left with a giant hole in a poison river. Right. Like, I'm not willing to have a poison river, Absolutely regardless not. of the yeah. fish or anything else. Yeah. So. Now, we all use minerals that come from the earth. All the time, every day, there is no hiding from that. But we need to move beyond this notion that it's a good idea to expose pristine fish and wildlife habitat nice. to open pit toxic mine waste that's gonna lay around on the earth's surface for generations to come. It's not a good plan. River smallmouths, everywhere you go, so are good. so much stronger than it's lake a whole fish. Different animal. Get up. Capture. Nice. Not only did Joe catch a legitimate 20 inch smallmouth on spinning tackle earlier, but this one here is his personal best smallmouth on a fly rod. The Menominee is treating him well. And though the smallmouth bite has been pretty good, the guys are still looking for a pike worthy of the dinner table. Similar to muskie, northern pike are apex predators, except they're much more prolific breeders and less finicky eaters. They're long, quick-killing machines with mouths full of razor-edged teeth that can attack and swallow prey more than half their own size. And that can be a big meal, since pike in certain places can grow to nearly 50 inches long. Pike get a bad rap in some circles, but let me tell you, they're a hell of a lot of fun to catch. Pike tend to hang out in slow, deep back eddies, what some people call frog water. So that's where the guys are focusing their food gathering efforts. Other than the lack of weeds, this has all the perfect oh, makings though. Yeah. I mean, it's- No doubt. Couldn't be pikier. Yep. 
They just know we want one that bad. Oh, just had oh, one. Oh, just oh, had oh, one. Oh, 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 oh. shit. Figure eight of Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Let me get my oral. A figure eight is a move used by pike and musky fishermen where the rod is used to draw a splashy figure eight with the intention of instigating a strike from a fish that is otherwise non-committal. Oh! Lunch! Looks delicious. <laughs> Dude, on the eight. On the eight on the spinner bait. I think I'm starting to like this boat, Joe. You know, it's my I, I didn't think that it wouldn't work here. It's just it's got so much more keel than the boats that you're yeah, using here. My, my only concern was will we get through? Where is this gonna bounce around? Right. Where are we gonna get stuck? But we were we were blessed with a little bit higher water, so we're yeah. not grinding out too bad. And once you take that out, the worry about getting stuck in this thing. It actually, it's comfortable and rows pretty nice. It's, I, it's clunky. Yeah. I would but say it turns. A, I it's would not say, a barge. I would say it is far more agile. When, when you pulled up, yeah. I'm like, oh my God, Joe. <laughs> you're going to kill me. You're going to kill us. Many anglers skip eating northern pike because of the difficult to remove Y bones. However, there are multiple ways of working around this, and the time investment is well worth the work. I am actually excited about this, man. It's been a few years since I've eaten northern pike, and uh, I feel like not that many people do that, and they're actually really good. It's actually one of my favorites. Yep. And we released so many smallmouth, it's just so nice to like, like have a fish dinner tonight. Right, right. Get ready, it's cooking montage time. Slow motion breading, deep frying. Damn, that looks good, doesn't it? Bratwurst, french fries, where's the squeaky cheese? You guys are killing me. You know, we've caught a lot of great fish here, and uh, you know, we, we, we've shown people a lot about your home river. We have. So, I mean, how are you feeling now that it's all said and done with, with spot burning? Are you worried about it? I'm sick about it. <laughs> no, I'll be <laughs> honest. You're honest, I'm gonna man. be totally honest, but I also <laughs> understand, and my entire guide crew was under the same understanding that in order for us to protect something like this, like there has to become awareness sure. on the mine, the fishery, etc., because that's number one, first and foremost, before what my operation or anything else is. So for anybody who wants more info or to get involved with the fight you guys are fighting against this mine, where can they go? Well, we have got a great group, the Coalition to Save the Menominee River, sure. which is fantastic. The website is jointheriverCoalition.org. Okay. And you can donate money, you can help a very small grassroots organization, and you can actually do something. Right. I mean, that is the most important thing anybody that can can, can think of doing to help me well, and help this river. It's a cause worth getting behind. I gotta say, man, we were a little worried about how this boat was gonna behave on this river, but cheers to cheers getting to you, through it on Made Das it. Boat. I think it's going to Hayward next, man. Which can only mean one thing, that's musky country. It's musky country, something's going down. So good luck with that. I'm glad I uh, wasn't uh, <laughs> part of the musky team. So before you go, I have a little gift, a little parting gift for you. And it is really a big deal because people come here from all over the country to try to get this. But we have got the Tight Lines 20 inch club where there's a specific hat. Yeah, I like the logo. Yeah, it's but good. The, but on the back of the back of the 20 inch hat. Oh, is, dude, no is way. The well, I mean, I'm gonna be honest. I didn't with know you. this was a thing, the 20 inch club. 19 in 15 16 doesn't cut it, but that was a legit tape 20, and uh, I, that's only my second of this season. I, I'm a man who's gotten a lot of free hats, and this is the <laughs> coolest one I've ever gotten by far. I will cherish it, man. Right on. Appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. On the next episode of Dose Boat, we join adventure angler Kevin Harlander and bass pro Oliver Nye as they take to America's heartland in search of the mighty muskie and the diminutive bluegill, two species that often share the same water, and I'll point out one has a tendency to wind up inside the guts of the other. Stay tuned, y'all. This is Das Boat.